Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I've been asked a lot of times what I think of saunas. The first thing is I love them because I'm a heat-seeking missile. I love heat. That's why I love having a hot yoga studio in this building. That's why when it's 95 degrees, I'm happy to go run outside. If the wind chill hits below 70, I have to stay inside or, or wear long sleeves. I do not like cold. I really like heat. So from the standpoint of just my own preference, uh, saunas, steam rooms, any place where there's heat, I'm going to be there. But um, is there any evidence that saunas have a therapeutic effect? So I get that question often enough that I decided to delve into it. And I wrote an article on it, which I'll share with you. So sauna bathing is a form of heat therapy that has a long history of use, thousands of years in many areas of the world. Reported benefits include improvements in health and, and spiritual growth even. There are different types of saunas, and those include Finnish, Turkish, and Russian, which are differentiated by the way that they're built, the source of the heat, and high, how high the humidity gets. Finnish saunas have been the most studied, and the typical sauna is made of wood. Wooden benches are built in for bathers to sit on. The temperature ranges from 80 to 100 degrees Celsius, which translates to 176 to 212 Fahrenheit, with low humidity someplace between 10 and 20 percent, which is increased from time to time by throwing water on the, on the hot rocks. Individuals typically spend someplace between 5 and 20 minutes in the sauna, which is generally followed by cooling off, sometimes via swim or shower. People can safely stay in the sauna for longer periods depending on their fitness and their developed heat tolerance. And in the beginning, it might only be five minutes, but I've, I've fallen asleep in a sauna for 45 minutes and find it very, very relaxing. Sauna bathing in Finland has been a tradition for thousands of years and has generally been used principally for relaxation. The average Finnish person bathes in a sauna two to three times per week for this purpose, but an increasing body of evidence suggests that regular use of saunas can directly improve both acute and chronic conditions. A recent review showed that regular sauna sessions resulted in a reduction in the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, lower risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, lower risk of sudden cardiac death and all-cause mortality. Middle-aged adults who regularly bathed in the sauna had lower systolic and diastolic blood pressure. In many studies, the effect was dose-dependent. The more weekly sessions in the sauna, the better the outcome. The researchers cited several reasons for these benefits, which included improvements in endothelial function, reduction in oxidative stress and inflammation, lower arterial stiffness, and improvement in cardiac functions. The authors wrote that a combination of, quote, the established role of physical activity in maintaining health combined with frequent sauna bathing when practiced together could lead to more health improvement than engaging in either activity alone. So in other words, sitting in the sauna and exercising, great combination. There are several mechanisms of action by which saunas can improve health. Short-term heat exposure in the sauna increases skin temperature. It activates the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, and many other pathways. This increases heart rate, blood flow, cardiac output, and sweating. Research also shows that whole body thermography results in increased nitric oxide production and increased vasodilation, additional mechanisms that contribute to overall cardiovascular health. Sauna bathing is often used for pain relief. Patients with fibromyalgia, either with or without an additional painful condition such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, reported improvements in pain and fewer tender points after 12 weeks of both combined sauna and underwater exercise therapy. In another study, sauna bathing for four weeks was shown to improve pain and stiffness in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, but the effect was not sustained after therapy ceased. So apparently you need to keep sitting in the sauna, which most people don't mind doing. They actually enjoy it. A study of patients with tension headaches reported a 44% reduction in headache intensity after six weeks of sauna treatment. Chronic fatigue patients reported decreased fatigue, lower anxiety levels, and improved mood after just four weeks of sauna therapy. Sauna use has been shown to improve symptoms in patients who have asthma and chronic bronchitis too. Now, I was shocked at how much research has been done on sauna, and I could have written a two-hour educational program on just the use of heat in uh, promoting good health, and maybe at some point in time when I have time, I'll do that. But um, there are a few risks associated with this practice. It's safe for pregnant women and children. Um, the biggest complaint is really that people have difficulty getting used to the heat. If you're not a heat-loving person like me, it might be difficult for you. But if you keep spending short amounts of time just increasing it a little bit at a time, most people acclimate pretty well. 
When used for pain relief, the effect tends to be temporary, which means continued sauna sessions are required for continued pain relief. But uh, I think the best use of sauna is as an adjuvant to other healthy behaviors like exercise and weight loss and, and healthy eating and that sort of thing, which can lead to more permanent improvements in health. But certainly sauna can be part of that as an adjuvant. And as I mentioned before, most people enjoy it once they get used to it. All right, on to the next topic. According to the World Health Organization, people should consume less than two grams of salt per day in order to prevent heart disease. Not a single member country has been able to achieve this goal from a population standpoint. The American Heart Association has an even more restrictive guideline and says that adults should consume only 1,500 milligrams per day. The Centers for Disease Control states that the average American, in spite of this advisory, consumes about 3,400 milligrams of sodium per day. So I think we can agree that worldwide attempts to restrict sodium intake have been a colossal failure. Well, according to a recent article in The Lancet, the recommendation to limit sodium intake may be misguided. I've put out a lot of information about this before. I'm just following up with more. This, um, the recommendation to reduce salt was based on individual data from short-term trials without any data from randomized trials or observational studies that actually showed that lowering salt intake reduces the incidence of cardiovascular events. Well, fortunately, the type of study that should have been conducted before the recommendations to reduce salt were initiated is being conducted now. The prospective urban rural epidemiology, or PURE study, involves populations in 21 countries. A recent analysis of data from the study included 95,767 participants in 369 communities in 18 of the countries that are part of the study. The subjects were adults between 35 and 70 years of age who did not have cardiovascular disease at the beginning of the study. Morning fasting urine samples were used to estimate sodium and potassium intake and blood pressure in all 369 communities and card along with cardiovascular disease and mortality in 255 of the communities was evaluated as part of this whole study. Potassium intake was tied to reduced cardiovascular risk in all areas studied. And that may be one of the keys to understanding this whole issue, is that eating more of a plant-based diet reduces sodium and increases potassium, and it may be the increased potassium intake that's the real issue. But in this analysis, the association between sodium intake and major cardiovascular events was not linear. In fact, there was an inverse association in people consuming the lowest tertile of sodium consumption, which was considered less than an average of 4.04 grams per day, still much less than the intake level recommended by health authorities. The researchers reported that sodium intake was only associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events in areas where average intake exceeded 5 grams or 5,000 milligrams per day. They concluded that in these areas, sodium restriction might be beneficial or appropriate, but not in other areas where sodium restriction is higher, for example, than the World Health Organization recommends, but under the five grams per day threshold. The same group of authors who did this analysis published another one two years ago, which reported similar findings. Now, those who advocate salt restriction often criticize your analysis as a means for measuring sodium intake and specifically challenge the validity of using one sample. While 24-hour urinary sampling is the best and it's a reliable measure measurement for um, intake, um, it's difficult to recruit and retain subjects when they're asked to provide several samples over a day's period of time. Fortunately, I was able to find several studies that confirmed that morning fasting uh, urine, urine sampling, including one uh, sample, using the Kawasaki formula is as accurate as 24-hour measurement. And that was the measurement tool used in the analysis covered in this article. Now, I want to be clear here. It is true that there are some people who are sensitive to salt. Some of the symptoms people experience if they're sensitive to salt include higher blood pressure after they eat salt and water retention. Salt-sensitive people clearly should reduce and watch their intake, but this should not be interpreted as a mandate for the rest of the population to do so. Most people do not experience worsening health as a result of eating, cell, uh, of eating salt, but they actually may experience worsening health as a result of restricting it. There are quite a few other articles in the Health Brace Library that you, on um, this topic, that you might want to take a look at. I still get a lot of hate mail when I talk about this salt issue, 
not because people are really sending me anything that is compelling and uh, the, about which I would change my mind, but, but mostly people just screaming at me that, you know, don't I know that salt is bad for you? And uh, screaming is not what this is supposed to be all about. Uh, just, just in case some of you don't know, scientific debate involves looking at evidence back and forth. Screaming is really not part of the deal. So um, my, my uh, intent in putting this out is not to promote the consumption of salt. It really goes back to something that I talked about on last week's video clips, which is we've got to make this easier for people to do. And when we pile on restrictions that are unnecessary, we're just making it harder, making it harder for people to sign up to change their diets, we're making it harder for them to stick with it. It's really counterproductive to the things we care about, which is people doing better for themselves and enjoying better health. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. Please hit the subscribe button and the little bell so we can find it, so you can find out when new videos are posted. Grow the subscriber base. We're going to give prizes out every time we hit major benchmarks. So hit the subscribe button. Pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you next week with more news.